Well, should we get started tonight? All right, cool. Um, so I think we'll, uh, so what we'll do tonight is the plan was to cover chapter 17 uh, for me to cover about 15 minutes of it. Uh, we'll see how fast I can get through it. And then um, Ryan um, said he would take the rest of or take 18. So we'll see how far we can get through 18 tonight as well. And then, um, you know, if Ryan has to jump off more than we're more than happy to have that happen. And I can talk about, I think there were some exercises from chapter 16 that, that I didn't get to. So we definitely have stuff to talk about. So there's, there's no, um, there's no lack of information that we could cover, but let me kind of start off with chapter 17. I'm going to share my screen here. Uh, chapter 17 really wasn't a lot of code. I mean, it was mostly like everybody can see my slides, right? Okay, cool. I mean, 17 was more kind of like big picture stuff. So kind of talking about, uh, you know, just general practices, especially within like software engineering or developing shiny apps. So it really wasn't a lot of like coding information, but it was kind of like bigger, bigger, like workflow kind of things. Um, and so I'm just going to kind of go through some of these and kind of discuss like some of the big kind of uh, like themes that were in it. Uh, really with the kind of the general guidelines, it really starts talking about this idea of like your apps growing and as your apps start to grow or your team starts to grow, focusing on one app, you're going to start uh, reaching new challenges where you're going to reach challenges in organization. So how you organize your app, the stability of your application, and then the maintainability. And so really it was kind of the, the bigger the application, the bigger the team, the more problems you're gonna have. And so there's other tools that you have to draw upon spe specifically in the, the realm of software engineering to um, aid you in kind of your workflow practice. The chapter really also kind of discusses, um, the chapter also really discusses, uh, it's kind of like an overview of what we're gonna come into next. So there's not really any like deep dive into it. I put some together some learning objectives. I'm not going to read each of these just for the sake of time, but this is kind of what the chapter was trying to get at. But the first thing that the book really talks about is like this idea of best practices or some of the best practices that you should be following. And it really kind of introduces this idea of the software engineering approach or that kind of mindset of a software engineer while you're developing Shiny. And so as your applications start to grow, you have to start taking on more of a software engineering approach because it's gonna make your application easier to work with. It's gonna make it more maintainable and it's gonna allow you to uh, work on your application a lot quicker for a lot more greater uh, iterations. And it really talked about, and I should have created a graphic of this, but it should be like a, a linear relationship. As your application gets more complex, the harder it is to work with. And so it really talks about this idea that, you know, developing these software engineering skills, it's a lifelong journey. It's not something that you can read a book and then, you know, learn it. It's, 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 a, it's a set of skills that you have to have. And this wasn't in the book, but I thought this was kind of important too. Um, you know, I, I am not, I am not a software engineer by any means, but I've sat in some trainings on like how to develop software and the two kind of things that I've heard before are like agile development versus this idea of software as a craft. And so those are kind of like different mindsets that are out there of how you go about creating software and that those are kind of different approaches of how you go about developing it. You might want to dig into these a little bit more, um, but, you know, that's kind of the things that I've, I've come across of this idea of like what type of mindset or what type of development approach you're going to take when you're developing software. Then the book kind of talks about decomposition, the idea of breaking up your application into functions and into modules, uh, which Ryan's going to cover tonight, which is functions. And then I think Kevin said he was going to take on modules, I think, right? So um, we'll get into that. It talks about organization. So uh, bigger picture. And Ryan, you could probably expand on this more with your um, participation within EPGES. This idea of that once you start developing a shiny application and it has a bunch of functions, try and wrap it up within a package um, for better organization. And then stability, the idea of testing, and then we're gonna get into security, and then we're gonna get into performance. So the book after that talks about this idea of um, kind of like when you're kind of learning these software engineering skills, this is kind of the common experience that people have. It usually starts off with this idea of 
that you don't understand something. And so you spend a lot of time trying to understand it. Once you kind of get a general understanding of it, you have to start referring to the docs. And so like while you're developing, you're continually going back and forth to see what the documentation says into developing your understanding. And then as you practice, 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 you finally get into, and I shouldn't say finally, but you start getting into a comfort level where you start getting more fluent with the, with the technology that you're using. Uh, my experience with Shiny as of right now, I would probably say I'm, I still need the docs, but there are some things that I definitely am starting to kind of get into the situation where I'm starting to understand things more fluently. But the book really talks about with this kind of software engineering approach or mindset that you're going to take on at this point in the book is, is this is a common experience that you're going to have. And so it's not unique to anybody. It's just, it's a common thing that most people go through when they're learning new skills, new technology, or new ways of doing things. So then the book talks about um, code organization. And so I really thought that this uh, quote was really informative. Um, you know, any fool can write code that a computer can understand, but good programmers write code that humans can understand. And so I thought that was a really important point, kind of going back to what I was saying last week, or the point that I was trying to make last week of this idea. When I first started programming, I thought complexity was key. Not necessarily. Sometimes in certain situations, you need to be focusing on getting other people to understand what you do. And because when you do that, if you improve readability and understandability, it's going to be easier for not only yourself to maintain that code base, it's going to be um, easier for other people to work on that code base as well. And I, and I was listening to a, a YouTube video about this, but they called it the bus factor. So like if you're working in a team, they called it this bus factor. And I hope this never happens to anybody or any team, but just think of hypothetically, if someone on your team were to accidentally get hit by a bus, would the code base be in a situation where someone could easily quickly pick it up and maintain it as if you were working on it as well? Again, I hope that never happens to anybody, but they called it the bus factor and I thought it was interesting. Uh, this other idea of empathy for others and then empathy for your future self. Um, if you're a single, if you're a person that's working on your own application, uh, you know, think about how you can create empathy for your future self, because your future self will be looking at this code base. And so what are the things that you can do to make it easier on yourself to pick it up? Uh, I had that experience with a project that I was doing this, a project that I was doing six months ago. I had to go dig into it. And I was just like, man, I wish I would have done a lot more code comments. I wish I made this a lot better because I have to re-upload all this information into my head to get it to work or to figure out what was wrong with it. And so have some em empathy on yourself, but then, you know, if your team starts growing, think about empathy for others. Uh, the chapter also talks about code clarity, some stuff you should do with that. Um, I kind of went back to this uh, tweet from Hadley um, back from 2015 that talks about code clarity and how you can start working on your skills to make your code clear. This idea that the only way to write good code is to write tons of, you know, excuse the language, but shitty code first. Uh, feeling shame about bad code stops you from getting to good code. And so it's just like any skill, right? You, you just have to take the time and you have to, you have to, you know, you have to kind of wrestle with it for a while and, and write really bad code to write really good code. And so um, I really think this was kind of an important thing is that the chapter talked about. Um, comments. Uh, I thought another thing about this with the code organization is trying to keep your functions to one page. I never really thought about that. I thought that was kind of important. And um, thinking about like if you are writing functions for your code to try and keep it within one page, uh, you know, thinking about it being printed on one page or run scroll. And so um, if it is longer than that, consider breaking it up into um, smaller chunks because then it'll be easier to maintain. Uh, I know this is a, I know the, this is kind of a, a sticking point for some people, but the less than 80 characters, so 80 characters in length going from left to right. Uh, I really try and follow this as much as I can. Um, R actually gives you a wonderful um, line. You can set this up in your settings if you want to. But like when you're writing code, 
to try and keep your code within that 80 character limit. Now, that's not a hard and fast rule. I've kind of read some of the background on why that's the case, but it just kind of helps you keep your code condensed if you can kind of keep it within under 80 characters. Um, something that I followed and I found it kind of valuable. Some other people, they don't care about it, but just something to think about. Uh, so, you know, thinking about copy paste development, trying to get rid of duplication, which we'll talk about with functions and functional programming. And then talking about, you know, things that are specific to Shiny. So creating functions so that you can um, better test functions outside of a reactive context and then using modules. Um, and, I, and I can't speak too much to modules to right now, but that's something that we'll cover later. Um, testing, uh, it really talks about testing. Um, I wasn't really clear on this idea of a test plan. Um, I, I think it basically is, is just have an idea of what you're gonna test for within your application. But I don't think that was really clear in the chapter, but I think it's something that we'll cover. And then um, really talking about going into, you know, how talking about that testing improves the stability of your application. And so ways to not only ensure that your application, uh, ensuring that any changes that you make within your application, there's not any downstream effects from that change. And if there was any downstream effects, you can have confidence that you'll catch that change or that effect that you have, but then also having the ability to have the confidence that if you are pushing this application to users that you know it's gonna work when they access it. Then it talks more about automation versus manual testing. Um, the testing chapter will talk more about this, but and it will talk a little bit later about continuous integration, continuous development. Those are things that I, that's stuff that's like way beyond me. I kind of understand the general idea of it and maybe we could talk more about it, but it talks about this idea between like automating your tests versus, you know, having manual tests that you do. Different types of tests, unit integration, functional load. I'm familiar with unit, but when it got to integration, functional and load, I didn't know much about it, but um, those are things that we'll probably come across. I did want to add this, this, um, this webinar that I came across, um, getting started with unit testing in R. I read this, I came across this in a tweet. It was put on by, I think the R Philly ladies group, a uh, really good one. It is a really interesting kind of start. Um, I really highly suggest people to watch this because it makes it, it makes testing accessible. Um, so I, I linked this within the notes. If you get a chance, I definitely suggest looking at this because it really kind of discusses like the idea of unit testing and it makes it accessible. Oh, here, I, I came up with this meme too, when it was talking about, uh, like thinking about like your cleanliness of your code. <laughs> Many of us probably have this experience if somebody opens up your, your um, opens up like your Git repo or something is looking at it, you know, we all have this experience of <laughs> don't touch my garbage, you know, this is my garbage, it's mine. Um, so I was going to share that one before, but I'll share it with you now. Uh but yeah, our, our, the Our Ladies Philly put that on. I think it's really good. It talks about testing behavior versus testing components, stuff that we'll dig into later. And um, there are some questions left over from the previous cohort about having too many tests, the wrong kind of tests, conversation we can have um, if we want to. Then it talks about dependency management. Um, I wasn't, I haven't really done a lot of this stuff. I've used our environment a little bit. But anytime that you think about dependencies, it's anything beyond the source code that requires that your application requires it to run. And so thinking about different packages that you have, thinking about different databases or different data sources that you connect to, those are stuff that's outside of the source code that you need to manage to make sure that your application or your analysis being done in your application is reproducible. It talks about different ways to do that with different packages, such as RM or PackRat. I'm familiar with RM. I haven't used PackRat, but there's Conda. I've used Docker, um, and we could talk about that, but um, you can use Docker to help manage your environments too as well. 
And then I thought it was really interesting, this idea of configuration. So managing your environments using configuration. I thought that was kind of cool. And so hopefully we get to that. And then it talks about um, different reproducibility requirements, you know, talking about your requirements to reproduce it based on your application versus if it's an analysis or a project. And then it also talks about different configurations that you need to have for your application. So, um, you know, a big one was talking about how you um, reference different files and your file environment. So it really emphasizes this idea of absolute versus relative paths. Um, I'm, this group um, is pretty familiar with this stuff, but it's just a reminder for anybody that's watching this later. There's a great discussion of this within R for data science, and I've linked it in here. Um, check that out because it really talks about like the importance of it. So, um, oh, thanks, Kevin. I was gonna say I put in a. This guy has, um, or I don't, I don't know the gender, but. Whoever writes this post, this blog has wonderful posts that are really fun on continuous integration with GitHub Actions. He's got a twit bot. Um, the one I sent you was update your readme, mm. uh, which actually has some really good scripts to get the latest stats on your website. But it also has about continuous integration in GitHub. I've been looking at that this week. So. Yeah, and I and I I would like to talk more about like continuous integration, continuous development, because like big picture, like I understand what it is, but then like when it gets to like the separate service like GitHub Actions, like my biggest fear is is like any time that these services are attached to a price tag, that's where it scares me, is because like I like I understand like I understand the the need for it and the use of it, but anytime that somebody attaches like the price onto computing. That, that scares me because I'm always afraid, like, I'll just rack up like a $10,000 bill and then it's like, okay, well, I don't have $10,000. So, <laughs> um, but no, I like, that's something that I would love to discuss with this group some more, but um, yeah. My angle right now is I've been going to GitLab. I can't seem to figure out GitHub Actions. I don't know why. I don't know what the difference is, but I've had... I finally got some success of GitLab. I like got a really right. simple script. I just ran like the penguins, did a summary of the penguins data set. I run it every morning at 5 a.m. <laughs> so <laughs> I just figured that out this week. So I'm happy for the I would I would agree with Kevin as well on the on the GitLab uh, side of CI CD. The uh, the Git GitHub actions, I'm still trying to wrap my brain around what the heck you're trying to do there. It, 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 it takes the place of old school uh, Jenkins or, or uh, uh, what was the one that they had the security flaw, uh, got in trouble earlier because they were passing, passing uh, credentials over plain text. Um, doesn't, uh, Travis, Travis CI, mm -hmm. uh, the GitHub Actions is, a, is a, an attempt as, as a replacement to Travis CI. Yeah, and so I, I like, and like I said, it was one of those things where like, I've heard of Travis CI, you know, I've heard of, I've heard of Jenkins, but then again, it comes down to the thing for me. And this is just for me is like, anytime that there's like money attached to it, then I get like kind of weary because I'm just like, how much is this actually going to cost? And so like, that's the biggest thing or like, you know, especially when they attach compute resources to it, like, oh, if you process this much data, you're going to, you're going to incur this much cost. And you're like, well, how much data am I really processing? And so. Set up but, an account without a credit card attached to it. <laughs> so either they won't let you do it or <laughs> so you can't get that far. I need guardrails. Like I need <laughs> guardrails. Like I, I don't know. And I know like it's, I know most of the stuff is pretty cheap, but at the same time I sit there and say like, you know, I could write an infinite loop somewhere and just let it sit overnight. And then I wake up and then um, I've lost my job because I have a $20,000 bill. So, but I, I haven't run into that, but that's like my biggest fear of, of like the GitHub actions is because it's not really clear of like, how much is this actually going to cost for like a small project? So anyways, um, but yeah, I mean, we could talk more about that, especially when we get to, I think, uh, I think it's probably in testing, but you know, some more stuff to consider. Sorry to interrupt. No. Oh, there's, there's a GitHub action that I want to get somewhere. Once you push, it will render your app to shiny apps.io. I'm like, I want to get there. 
Oh, I that want... would be great. Oh, sorry. Go ahead, Kevin. No, I just was saying I want to go to there. <laughs> like, I understand the importance of it. And like, I think it's really cool. And uh, and I mean, with the book too, the book does CICD stuff too. Like it will, like if, if you do a get or if you do a merge into like the master branch for the book from your fork, it does automatic checking for you through GitHub actions. And so I think it's just a YAML file. Like, I think it's just a YAML file that you do like step-by-step step of all your checks that you want to do. And then that's part of like the, the, the pull request. And so that's where I got my first introduction to it was through this book club. And I was like, oh, that's really cool. I wish I could totally do that because then, because I have people on my team that submit stuff and I'd be like, it'd be great if I just had just like automatic checking of stuff that we have. So um, yeah, I would love to talk about this more for sure. Uh, I don't think I really need to talk about source code management. I think most people in here uh, you know, are familiar with, with source code management. Um, for people that are out there um, watching this later, Definitely check out anything regarding Git or version control, um, you know, different third-party services to host your repos, whether that be GitHub, GitLab, or any other service that's out there. But just for our group and, and knowing our knowledge in this group, I don't think I need to dig too much into that. We already talked about continuous integration and continuous deployment. So we'll cover that some more later. And then I think the, uh, the last thing that the book was talking about was code reviews. And I thought this was super important. Um, this is probably where I've learned a lot is through code reviews, um, watching how other people do stuff. And so like when my team does work and they submit um, their code, it allows me to better learn because I can see how there's other ways to do things. In addition to that from learning is this idea of that code reviews, um, help improve the code base. It helps catch bugs quicker. And so having that fresh set of eyes on, you know, submitted code allows people to make better code. And so, and to write code that's, uh, has less problems. Speeds up learning, which I mentioned before, um, this was left over from the previous cohort. And I'd be interested to hear from other people here, you know, are there any tricks to speed up code review? Um, Although, and, and this is just my current experience right now, although I find the value of code review good, you know, we're under time pressure to get things out. We're under time pressure to get, fun we're, we're under time pressure to push new, new things out, new reports. Um, we don't always have time to have code review. And, you know, right now I have like two projects that I have code reviews that are pending and that I need to get done. Hopefully my boss isn't listening to that because I need to get them done. But, you know, it's just something that takes time, time that takes away from development. And so if anybody has any tricks to speed that up, you know, let's talk about it. Uh, who should review who? I think, you know, everybody should review it. Um, I also think that, you know, I think you should also put um, some responsibility on other people within your team. This is my own perspective so that they get the ability to review it and see how other people do stuff. Um, so again, these questions were left over from the previous group. So, um, but, you know, code review, anti-patterns, and then, you know, alternatives, complements. Uh, I've done pair programming. It works. And we could talk more about it um, a little bit too, but that's kind of code reviews. Again, I'm trying to speed through this because I don't want to jump into Ryan's time here, but what questions or comments do people have? I was just thinking of code reviews. I, I just don't have the, that experience, but I'm just wondering where if you can set up some automated testing, you can get some, I, I start my test with the most silly mistakes and just go from there and just kind of work out. So that way, at least you have that covered. <laughs> like, I know I don't have any null values in here. <laughs> like, and then that way that can save some time to where you can focus on your peer review, the critical um, items. That was just a thought. No, I was going to add. Oh, good. Sorry, sorry. Go I was going to add. Um, if you are doing a peer review uh, between you and and other coworkers, um, I have found that uh, try to keep your critiques as constructive as possible. Um, it's very simple, and it in journalism or editorial, Colin, you're probably familiar with this too. It can appear that the person that authored is being attacked. 
um, <laughs> you have to be very constructive and in a good relationship with the team. Um, otherwise, uh, it could become very hostile. Code review can be, become very hostile. Um, one person thinks they're smarter than the others kind of concept. Yeah, and there was some um, there are some extra resources that were provided in like linked in the chapter, and I kind of scanned those through, and they talked about that. Like, you know, it's it there there's a balance, and then you know I, I can't say that I have a lot of experience doing code review because our team has only grown um, to a point where we have to have code review now. But the idea of is the conversation going from like constructive criticism into an academic type of conversation. Because if it's getting into an academic, you know, philosophical conversation, you know, is that really creating value to get, you know, functions or to get things pumped out or to get, uh, you know, to try and get your, to try and create value. And so there was a really, there was a good conversation in those materials that talk about, is it getting into a situation where it's constructive feedback, where you're creating value, or are you just having an academic conversation of, should we be using base or should we be using tidy? you know, tidy verse, stuff like that. So, um, I don't know, I, other thoughts that people have. Like I said, I don't want to be, I, I kind of felt like I sped through that, but again, I don't want to, you know, jump into Ryan's um, opportunity to start talking about functions, but, um, that's pretty much chapter 17. It's pretty much broad brush strokes. Um, because we're going to kind of dig more into this stuff a little bit later. And there's definitely a lot of stuff that I thought I found was like, oh, great. You know, I'm going to get some exposure to this and, I, and I'm excited about it. So uh, with that, if nobody has any more comments or questions, I'll turn it over to you, Ryan. Outstanding. I'm going to see if I can shut down Messenger. I don't know if it will completely shut off. Um, everyone's talking about the storm. So I'm getting notifications like crazy. I'm going to try and keep that turned off if possible. Well, at any rate, if anybody is uh, able to witness these notifications, so be it. Um, all right. I should have the web page running or maybe I need to re it. I'll go ahead and share screens real quick. Um, because I'm doing this off of a, a single service, um, now let me I'm sorry, sir. I'm going to re-knit this and then display the browser. Uh, because it's one desktop display, um, I want to make sure that I'm keeping all the other stuff out of the way. And we should be good. If there's any accidental shares, I can cut it out too. So don't <laughs> no worry worries. about that. You bet. No worries. Uh, all right. So let's get back to Zoom and share screen and let's go with this one and hit share all right i'm hoping that you're seeing my uh browser which is where there it is okay um obviously i've made a mistake in my numbering sequence um this is just because i put uh, chapter 18 into the title. It actually rendered as chapter 27. Um, not a big deal. All right. So putting together the learning objectives, um, just as a warning to the team, my battery is currently at 4%. So I'm going to bank that this is going to shut down on me. If it does, I will switch over to my phone. The learning objectives I put together, I said, um, use functions to reduce duplications. Um, we want to use functions to aid in maintenance. Um, we use functions to make server debug debugging independent from the reactive calls. And then finally, it spreads, spreads out a large, shiny app into more manageable chunks. Okay, so you're going to be uh, taking uh, large, what would be a, a top-down uh, app, uh, a really long code base, and then breaking it up into these smaller manageable uh, file sets. Okay. For a recap on functions, please see the R4DS book, Chapter 19. Uh, where Mr. Wickham uh, goes extensively into the use of functions within all levels of R. Uh, that link is active if you want to check that out. Um, you need three attributes for a function to work. 
Um, the first one is obviously the name of the function. We want to give it an ID, something that we can uh, call on, uh, make it uh, uh, recognizable in our code base. We need to pass it the arguments of what the function is going to be manipulating. Um, so, and then the final would be the actual body of the function, which would be actually what it's doing. So naming of the function, any arguments that you're passing it, and then the uh, uh, body or, or the call itself of what process it's doing, okay? I'm using a simple example here, uh, which is just labeled Ryan, myself. Um, you will notice that the word function is always in the front of these calls it makes it really obvious that it's a function. And a good example would be when you call on the server side of your Shiny app, uh, server, function, uh, input, output, session. There's your, there's your function and your arguments. Uh, in this case, we're uh, creating a range uh, using the range function. Uh, we're calling it function name. I'm trying to be as very clear about what I'm doing here. Uh, so we're passing to the range function, the name of the function name. Uh, we're passing the argument as uh, no, uh, remove any NAs as true. Again, I'm using the call of function. This is the body of the function. So now it's function name minus range one divided by uh, range two minus range one. Now, this is just a really funny sort of output. But if I were to run this code, uh, you would see it as zero. Uh, I think it's, uh, we're passing it, the numbers zero, five, and 10 uh, when, I, when I run this. Um, what you get is the output of this particular uh, uh, arithmetic, okay? Um, any questions on that service? I just have a quick question. Go ahead, I'm boss. I'm just trying to, in your argument? Yes. No, in your, like, on the top structure, the arguments, why is there a function name there? Like, that's, is, I'm, I'm calling it function name before it was just labeled as I think ID or some other uh, uh, point. Uh, so I was just renaming it so that the term function name uh, stood out more of, of where you're calling it. Um, okay. okay. Yeah, I can, I can go back and show you exactly what this looks like from the R4DS book if you'd like me to click on that link. No, I was just curious. I'm just trying to... It, it, check out check out the first code yeah. snippet in chapter 19. That's actually where I'm pulling this example from. Uh, uh, R4DS, uh, uh, do the uh, uh, R for data science uh, book and then uh, chapter 19 is functions. As much as I love that book, that's not my favorite chapter. No, I mean, agreed. I, just, uh, I, I just don't, I could not learn functions that way. Well, um, we'll, we'll but, find out in a, in a moment, as I go through this chapter, there's a couple of questions that I have uh, that just didn't quite make sense. Even even researching it didn't quite connect the dots of what the text was trying to convey. Um, let me show you. Uh, I think it's after this next section. Uh, it'll jump out at us. So the next topic is talking about file organization. Now, this is a really brief paragraph, but what we're discussing is encapsulating or storing your sub processes, these uh, R files into a location. So your namespace variable, your, your path of where these functions are called, you can just pull them back in. Um, it makes a lot more sense when you're dealing with Golem and package management. Um, all of your sub helper functions or, or, or these scripts are going to be written into a location um, that you can just go and manipulate those calls directly if needed. Um, a great example would be if you go to dplyr, uh, ggplot, uh, uh, even the Shiny uh, uh, application, uh, look at what the R files are doing. So when you call on a particular function, you can go into its sub R script and, and see exactly what the maintainer or the, the developer was writing at that moment. So. The example that I have here is the uh, directory R and then underneath would be the name of the function dot R. So you could, you could I, I'm using the term encapsulate. It's probably the wrong definition of, of use of the, the term, but um, I'm saying that we're inserting the text of that function as a body or as a, a, a logic uh, in its own file. 
within our main server uh, UI or server uh, call, we're just calling on the function. The system already knows where to find it at. Okay. Same thing goes with our utilities. Uh, these are uh, more minor details, small one-liner type uh, code snippets. You can put those into a utilities.r file, and then you're just pulling those out of, of uh, that call. I don't have any exact examples with that in use, um, so I do want to apologize. It is great and awesome if you do want to use a package management system. Um, the example that we're given within the sphere of our studio would be the Golem package. Um, Colin, you mentioned uh, version control and, and configuration control with PackRat and uh, our environment um, services or packages. Um, Golem would self-contain all of that for you. Um, PackRat is a good example of, of doing that. Um, you can put a lot of CSS data and, and JavaScript data, R file data into PackRat uh, because it is kind of a package management uh, service. You call it once and then you get all the, the fun sauce that comes along with it. Okay. Uh, continuing on. I, and again, I'm, I'm reiterating myself here, but ultimately we want to make these shiny apps uh, decompiled or deconstructed into a more manageable form. The larger they get, the more complex they get. If you were to maintain it in one single file, it's going to be a little unruly. By making it into these smaller manageable chunks, you can only work on one service or even expand it, uh, use it as a template for other shiny apps as well. Okay, continuing on. All right, so here we're talking about UI functions and the example we're given within our user interface is just a slider input. Now, Colin, I, I respect and, and support a earlier statement you made in your presentation of chapter 17. Um, the idea of sometimes code is ugly, but it works. Um, as we become more, more eloquent or more uh, uh, add some more finesse to our coding, we become more mature in our, in our uh, authoring of Shiny. Um, we don't need to make four different calls all passing the same content. What we can do is create a function, which now we just pass it a list of names and then it automatically produces what we want. So here's an example of a UI uh, creating a slider input. Um, in this case, we're calling it alpha. Uh, the label is also called alpha. We have a minimum and maximum value within the slider and then a decrementer of 0 0.5 and then a step sequence of 0.1. So it's gonna be the value of zero to one uh, starting at 0.5, kind of the middle of the road, and then incrementing and decrementing by 0.1 uh, 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 number uh, sequence. Okay. What you can do instead of four different lines of text is you can put in just a function call. In this case, I think we lost him. He'll jump on here pretty soon. I, you know, I, oh, go ahead. Go ahead, Kevin. I was going to say, you know, do you know how I learned to do functions? It was learning Shiny. I learned Shiny before I could do functions. Really? Yeah. Because I am that, like... that abstract of the inputs and the outputs, mm -hmm. it hit me. I was like, oh my gosh, that's how you, that's like a function. <laughs> yeah. Like I am, I am the complete opposite. Like <laughs> I learned functions and I mean, like, I don't, I don't know if you've done the R for DS just yet. I don't know if you've, have you read that book yet? Yeah, but I've just kind of, I want to try to look something up or find, I kind of use it as a reference book. Yeah, um, and I'll put this in the group. I'll put this in for the group. So um, I actually, they did, we did a cohort for, for R for DS and I covered the functions chapter. And so there's two videos for this. And I mean, use them for what you want, yeah. you know. Um, but they're just, uh, they're the two, they're two sections. And Ryan, I don't mean to be jumping over your time here. I'll let you jump in here a second. Um, That's okay. But there, we talked about functions in here. And so I had a bunch of examples that I used. And so I, I, I mean, I understand functions at a pretty good level and functional programming. So um, 
I try my best to try and break it down as best I could. I probably should rewatch these, but anyways, sorry, Ryan. That's okay. I actually lost all my presentation media since the laptop died and I have not committed it to uh, uh, GitHub for us for somebody else to present it. Um, I stopped at the, the comment about the UI and the, and the um, I don't know, grouping it into a, a one liner where you're just um, calling on the function and then it, it producing uh, each one of the sliders. It's only the third or fourth section of the chapter. Um, I think it's made up of about eight different uh, groups or, or, or I guess I was going to open up a conversation about the, uh, the last point right before the summary um, is talking about input of data and the uh, I had no idea or, or the examples that were in the text. Uh, I did not reference exactly what they were talking about. Um, for the team's purposes, I, I don't know how to finish the presentation with, <laughs> without having the computer. Um, I jumped back over on the phone so I could, I could at least finish talking, but. No, that's fine. I mean, what we could do is we, you know, we can finish it up, you know, next week too. So, okay. um, you know, don't don't feel like we need to rush through it or anything like that so um i do i do ahead. really apologize that was 100 percent my fault when i when i rushed out of the house to, to see how far i could get um <laughs> i reached into the bag and realized i didn't grab my power brick um so looking at the battery on the laptop was kind of like i knew it wasn't going to last forever so i'm really sorry for the team on that subject uh, don't worry about it it's, it's all good um I, the one thing that, and I mean, we can just open up our conversation to kind of where we left off. The one thing that I just like, like when talking about functions and I've been trying to like play around with this because there's one function and I wish I could share the application with people to get their idea of it. But like the one thing that I've been having trouble with is if you write, the one problem that I've been having is that, is that I've wrote a function to be used on the server side that takes a reactive as an input. But the problem is, is that it will run the reactive once, but then once I try and like change an input to like invalidate that output, it doesn't draw the connection again to pull that reactive in. It was like, and I and I, I need to, I, it's, it's an app that I'm doing for work, so I wish I could share it here, but I can't. And I've been trying to think of how I would put an example together. Yeah. But there was like, it's, it's weird because like, if like I take a reactive value as an input, it's like it loses its reactivity. And so it's, I don't know if anybody's come across that or not. How you're There's explaining a, it doesn't make sense to me because it definitely should change. It shouldn't, it should just update based on the change of the input. So I'd love to see like a toy example, see what you mean. No. So Go ahead. What else? What I was going to add, Kevin, you're right. However, if the reactive call is part of the body of the function, then it's going to reset itself the next time the function runs. Does it make sense? So what you want to do, Colin, would be take that reactive component out of the body and try to put it outside of your, of your function itself. Um, it, uh, so let me think of it this way. If it's on the server side, it's expecting an input from the UI to render, right? Or, or, or to create that, that reactive call. You would want to put that outside of your function, but yet still pass it as an argument into the body of your function so that it would uh, uh, augment, change, manipulate, and out output again. Um, mm -hmm. You don't need to share the code. It, that's actually the, uh, uh, I want to say that's in the, there's a section of chapter 18 that is dedicated to reactivity and non-reactivity of functions. And I, there's a, it's a sentence uh, within the last paragraph of that subsection that talks about uh, moving the reactive call outside of your, of your function call. It would still work. You're, you're going about it the right way. I would only just say, move that reactive call outside so that it's not being manipulated every time the function runs. Mm. Oh, I think. Do you understand? It's, it's I, almost I, like a poor use ahead. of recursion almost, right? A recursive call is obviously manipulating itself like four loops and, and the I value kind of uh, incrementer. 
you want to take that outside of the function so that it's not continually re resetting itself. The reactive call is not continually resetting itself. That's why it's not uh, maintainable after the first run. Oh, so it's in the function. It's actually in the function. Okay, yeah. so you're not using it. You're not supplying a function with a reactive value. Yeah, pretty much. So okay. like I posted this in the Slack channel, like this, the problem that I was having, cause I was trying to reduce repetition in my application and I have a small example, but I, let me, um, I think I know what you're talking about, Ryan, because that's the same thing that people brought up within that, within that Slack discussion was the same thing with, um, trying to remove the reactive outside of the function. Um, you can still pass it as an argument you can still pass it as a variable into the yeah. into the function itself there's no reason that that can't happen you just want to remove the ability of the function controlling the reactive behavior um, mm -hmm. so by by taking that reactive call and placing it outside and then passing it into the function it won't reset uh, uh, like you're you're experiencing currently uh, that makes sense yes yeah, that makes more sense to me too mm -hmm. I have to play around with it um, Maybe I could put a, a, the example that I have doesn't have this exact problem in it, but um, maybe I can throw it into the, the Slack afterwards. But like, that was the one thing I ran into just recently with this application was, you know, it was losing its reactivity. So when I was changing the, was that when I was changing the input, it would invalidate the output, but the output wouldn't draw, it wouldn't pull yeah. from that reactive to update itself. And mm -hmm. I think, and I think the reason is, is, you know, it's, it's, I think it's, I think it's, you know, it's, it's a bug, not, a, it's a feature, not a bug because it's doing uh, lazy loading. It's just taking the cached value. And so, uh, I, you know, I think that's the first time I've ever thought about that in, in the context of shiny. It's, it's, it's a feature, not a bug because it's doing what it's supposed to do. I'm just not setting it up correctly. <laughs> We had talked about that with our MIS. The computer is doing exactly what we told it to do. <laughs> we have to tell it something different now. <laughs> Computers are dumb machines, right? Um, yeah. <laughs> it, it's, it's, it's fighting with your human logic that uh, <laughs> you have the, the battle to, to, to fight with. Now, there's a, uh, so there's a, 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 a moderator uh, question that was posted by a user uh, concerning a JavaScript function. And it was similar to the reactive call concept. Uh, they want to iterate over uh, various tabs of search media, but the way the JavaScript call operates, it's pulling from the, um, the uh, ID of each tab. Well, how do we know as maintainers what the ID is? That's kind of at a lower level of the, of the function, right? Um, when the shiny serves this material to the UI, um, how do we know what ID number has been assigned to that tab? And the, uh, so I was working with the person to, to kind of rethink how they're applying this function. Um, and that, uh, yeah, it's in a similar context of what you're dealing with, Colin. Yeah. And that's the other thing. Oh, well, like, that's the other thing too, is, is like putting up the reproducible examples, like for stuff like this is a lot, is challenging. And so like, and I, and I find that I find that hard too sometimes is when people share their their application the code's just too much to like mm -hmm. pick apart and so reproducible examples help out a lot in this situation but I did also find the benefit of the functions you know if you if you abstract that, that stuff out to a function it makes debugging a lot easier because you can throw a browser into it and then you remove that issue of reactivity so you can you know get out of that reactive context to play with what's in the function environment. So I found that valuable. And another debugging tool you can use too, is I just take it, if you have a function, you can call it into a script and just script it and see what it's doing too, because it should be pretty close. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, I think that's, yeah, that's, that's a great point. I'll cover these two topics uh, uh, next week, but the, the two sections of this chapter that I had to scratch my head at is, um, the topic of, I've got the book in front of me, it is you, uh, other applications. So that section, I didn't feel added any value to the topic or I missed exactly what the author was conveying with the heading of other applications. 
um, it's giving three examples of code snippets, but I'm, I'm, I'm failing to connect with what they were implying with these other function inputs. Um, I, I think what, if I can, if I can summarize what was being conveyed in that section, I think what they're doing is talking about um, like function reuse, uh, being able to write it once and then use it in multiple shiny apps or, or multiple uh, utilities. Um, I believe that's what they were driving for. And then the, the second uh, point of this chapter that I'll cover again uh, is the last section, internal functions. Uh, and this is where they were separating the differences between the UI side, user side, and then the server side. Um, this internal function thing, uh, it's not a thing, it's it's a, a application or a service, but what they're implying with the text of this internal function section. I don't, that one, I literally said, uh, pull up the code snippet in the book and let's have a conversation of what they're trying to convey. But um, in the coming week, if either one of you want to look at that and throw your two thoughts or two cents into it, um, I'll try to spend a little bit more time in researching what we're trying to discuss in that topic. But similar to Kevin's comment about the R4DS book as a reference material, it is a little hard to interpret or digest. Um, you're almost trying to crack open Mr. Wickham's brain and kind of, what are you getting at here? Um, I don't quite grasp or understand the importance of this topic in the uh, chapter itself. So the, the functions chapter or just the, the book in itself, like the R for DS? No, the functions, the functions chapter I'm, I'm covering this chapter 18, it's the last section internal functions is the title. Mm -hmm. um, looking at the code snippet that's there and reading the text as it is applied to that code snippet, I wasn't recognizing the importance of what they were, uh, what the author was conveying. Um, we've got some text here talking about internal functions. We've got a code snippet. What are we relating here? What what is the importance of that that piece of information? Um, and I'm I'm reflecting that with Kevin's comment of the R4DS book. Sometimes within that R4DS book, there's topics covered that don't quite make sense. It doesn't fit what your it doesn't fully convey the importance of that topic in the chapter of whatever it is you're covering. It could just be me as well. It could just be me interpreting or reading the data too. No, I, I mean, I, I totally agree. I think, well, I mean, just thinking about R for DS, and this is my own opinion. Um, it's trying to provide, it's, it's trying to provide as many tools as possible for you to get a better sense. And it's like, it's not like, like one focus thing. Like this one's like focus on creating a shiny application and improving it. Um, like R for DS, it's like, there's just a wide range of things that you can come across in data science. And so, um, you know, there are definitely some sections in R for data science where you sit there and go like, what, why do I need a window function for the life of me? I still don't understand what a window function is. Like, I don't understand it, but I, I totally agree with you when it comes to the internal functions. I have to kind of dig into it too. Cause I didn't, this one was kind of unclear for me, the internal functions part, and then the other one that you mentioned too, which was, um, oh, the the one where you gave like the options to the other applications, like I kind of understood it, but the icon radio buttons one, that one was like I don't understand this one, but that's just me. The the well, you're you're hitting it exactly, uh, uh, conveying the confusion of of that point my statement was that it's i think it's trying to say that you can reuse functions that you've written in one app into another app which would make sense right it makes your life easier as a developer you've got this little i don't know magic widget that is used in every single template and because it's it's clean and reusable code um, you just pull it into whatever application you're building um, it, 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 it makes more sense. I think that's what they were conveying. The internal function topic, though, that one threw me for a loop. I'm, I'm still, 
wondering if is it talking about like R6 content um, where you're you're starting to get under the hood of what Shiny is doing. But anyway, I'll spend a little bit more time and, and saturate on that topic and see if I can better wrap my brain around for next week on that subject. Well, I'm wondering if, and I mean, this is just me thinking out loud. So if anybody's watching this, this is a completely half-baked thought here. I'm thinking this has to do something with like creating multiple outputs with that observe event, right? Because this pace zero, and I'm looking at the first example of the internal functions. I, I think it has something to do with like, it's trying to iterate through those inputs to create that update tab set panel. So I don't know, I have to dig into it. I, I have no good answer to that, but that's just- uh, You might be on, no, you might be on something there. No, that's exactly what, uh, so the comment I was making about the search function, this JavaScript utility that the user was trying to deploy, I'm, maybe that's similar to how this is, is operating. So you have, a, you have an input and you iterate that input across many other services on this UI side, excuse me, on the server side, the input side. I mean, I'm totally shooting from the hip there. So um, the question is, is like, cause update tab set panel, is that like a render function of some type? That's what I'm wondering is if it's a render function of some type. That's just what I'm thinking of right now. I'm looking up well, what the, go ahead, go ahead. Well, I was gonna say, if you notice the switch page, all right, so yeah, switch page and then the update tabs set panel, those two lines of text uh, are pulled uh, outside of the server call. So in the first example, this is on page 256, or if you're online, it's, it's literally the last section of this chapter 18. But if you're looking at the, the way the first example is written, we have server function input output session, curly bracket, and then switch page. If you look at the second example, the switch page call as a function is pulled outside of your server. And Colin, this is similar to that reactive comment we were just discussing a moment ago with your use case example, um, the react, uh, the the reactive is resetting every time it, it, it runs again. Uh, it doesn't save that, that input. This could be an example of where you could take your reactive call and pull it outside of your, of your server. It would still run, it would still operate, it would still receive it as an input. And then you could pass that argument back in to your function call and it, then it should reset or it, it would maintain uh, persistence. Hmm. Hmm. Do you see how ever so slightly different those two blocks are? Yeah, it has something to do with input <clears throat> because it's, it has something to do with input. What's throwing me off is like this wizard input because it's not how I would understand input, you know, the input dollar sign like it's normally talked about. So the wizard thing's throwing off. Any thoughts, Kevin? <sighs> Well, I think the 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 wizard's just your it's referencing up to the UI, right? It's not an output, so you want to have the dollar sign. So that kind of makes sense. That's, you know, I think you guys are on to something. But um, yeah, this one this one threw me for a loop too. <laughs> well, I, I I think this will pass into the to the modules. So one of the, the last comments I was going to make in the summary of, of the presentation, again, I'll cover this next week too, but the use of a function is either UI related or server related. It's not both. You either have it as a, a server side function or a UI side function. Once we get into modular, Kevin, if you cover that topic, the relationship is now a module allows us to manipulate like terms across UI and server. It's, it's, it's just a slight 
entire global function call because now the inputs and outputs are being managed by the module instead of just a single function. I'll let, I, I don't want to take away from Kevin when he does cover that as a topic, but. Yeah, I'm already at 7.03, so I don't want to hold anybody who needs to jump off or anything like that. Maybe we should, we should table some of these thoughts and, and kind of play around with some of these examples and, and see if we can figure some more of this out. But um, Ryan, are you, are you cool with finishing this up next week? And then um, we Kevin, if we have time, uh, you know, if we can start our conversation of, you said modules? Yeah. Okay, cool. Well, uh, yeah, I think we'll go. I think we'll go next week, the 22nd, and then we can talk about the 29th after that or next week and then go from there. Um, cool. I can hang out for a little bit more. People want to talk a little bit more. Um, but, you know, if you got to jump off, you got to jump off. That's cool, too. So I'll leave it up to the group. All right. I got to run. You guys stay safe out there. See you, Kevin. Thank you. I appreciate your patience. All right. Bye.